Oh, good afternoon, one and all. We're so happy you joined us for our Coffee with the Principals afternoon. And um, I am joined by the incomparable chairs of our houses of study. And um, we're going to talk this, this particular afternoon. And I hope everybody has a little something warm and sweet to drink. If you don't, feel free to run and grab something. This is a casual, informal time where we just get to dive into dive into good um, thoughts and ideas together. And this time of year, because right now, as we currently gather, it's, it's November and we're right up on the Thanksgiving holiday for Americans. And then soon, very soon, Christmas is coming. And I don't know if you all have yanked out your decorations yet or not. We haven't braved that yet in my household, but um, people are beginning to think that way. And certainly stores and everything, pulling out all the decorations and lights. And we thought it was a great time to think about what is this light and the presence of light and the emphasis on light. Um, what is it all about? Not only just in the secularized holiday tradition, but more specifically in each one of our um, Christian traditions that we think about the significance of light. So, um, like I said, I wanted to invite the chairs of our houses. And um, first of all, we have Presbytera Maria, who is the chair of our Orthodox house, and more specifically, she's the principal of our St. Raphael Orthodox School, and um, so she'll be reflecting from the Orthodox tradition. Then we have uh, Miss Monica Meinhart, who is the chair of our Aquinas House of Studies, um, our Catholic house, and she'll be uh, reflecting on the significance of light um, from the Catholic perspective. And then we have Miss Rhea Bright, who is the chair of our Canterbury House, which is the um, Protestant Anglican House of Studies. And so all of us come from these varied traditions, but one thing that we have in common is our common recognition that light is present it literally and symbolically throughout scripture and then throughout our own various um, traditions. And we're so happy to welcome the lovely and talented Miss Allison Johansson as, as our guest today as a, a representative of our wonderful Scully Academy instructors. So I thought what I'd do to open is just read um, a few verses as the observation that light is indeed present throughout scripture from beginning to end, my friends. So of course, and, and if I say these things, you will even be able to finish my sentence. Genesis 1 verse 3, it says, and God said, let there be light, I right? Know. Right there at the beginning. And then flip open that holy scripture right to the middle and you usually land in the psalms and the psalms are full of recognitions and symbols of of god and psalm 27 1 says the lord is my light and salvation whom shall i fear and then move further into the New Testament and the Gospels and the life of Jesus. And you hit John 8, 12, and Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world, right? I'm the light. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then you go all the way to the end there in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, verse 23, and it says, the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamb. Mm -hmm. So like I said, beginning to end, light is present in scripture. So I thought, my friends, where is my, oh, I had a box of matches. Oh, they're there. I thought they disappeared for a minute. So. Many of us do this in our own traditions and so forth. The significance of light and the lighting of candles and so on and so forth is something that um, reminds us of things and teaches us things and invites us to reflect, right? That light means something to God and to us. 
So with that recognition, I want to hand it off to these lovely ladies who, um, for whatever reflection you have for us, and Presbytera, feel free to um, kick us off with either either a prayer or launch straight into um, what you would like to share. The floor is yours. Oh, heavenly King, comfort and spirit of the truth who are present everywhere and fill us all things, treasury of good things and giver of life. Come, abide in us, dwell in us, and cleanse us for every stain, and save our souls, O oh, gracious Lord. Um, for, for Orthodox Christians around the world, um, on the new calendar, um, and 13 days later for old calendar Orthodox Christians, um, tomorrow is the beginning of the Nativity Fast meaning that we will be fasting from anything that's um, animal-based. There's also there's exceptions in this fast in that um, we can have fish on certain days, um, but that's when we begin to dress the home uh, with Christmas on the first day of the Nativity Fest. And we don't take down our Christmas decorations until Thaphany. So January 6th. Um, so that's a tradition of the Orthodox Church in which um, along with the fast and the liturgical calendar is what the home also reflects. And so when you were opening up that candle, um, Joy Lynn, I couldn't help but think of the, the, the hymn at the resurrectional service prior to saying Christ is risen it says, come receive the light from the unwaning light, right? And it's a beautiful hymn, um, de lavate fos, right? Come receive the light from the unwaning light, the one that never loses its, uh, its um, beauty, strength, who he is. And so within the Orthodox Church, as well as you shown in the Bible, light is mentioned everywhere. And the Orthodox tradition, we depend a lot on our senses, what we see, what we smell, what we hear, what we taste, right? What we say, um, what we feel. Um, and so light is ever present. When we walk into the narthex, the main part of the church prior to the nave, we light a candle because we're coming out from the darkness and into the light, right? We're lighting that candle being representative of Christ, what he did for us. And then of course, us being those little lights of Christ um, and coming into the world. So light is something that's ever present and is found everywhere. Now, St. Gregory Palamas, and I pulled up a quote from um, one of his great works, which I love of the triads. He said, this light, the light of Christ, right? Is an hypostatic symbol, the uncreated radiance of God, a divine energy. This manifestation of Christ in the divine nature is not something external to ourselves. It is in turn uh, interiorized through the life of asceticism. In this case here, um, he is using it as monastic, but really we can look at it as relates to living the faith, right? Like fasting and prayer. Christ will radiate within us. So this sense of light isn't just an exterior light, but rather an interior light that when we approach and we um, become little Christ, baptized, right? In the tomb, coming out of the womb of baptism, we too have this unwaning light that is that of Christ. So the sense of light externally is huge, but also internally. And one of the things, especially with the nativity of Christ coming up, is 
when we think of the mother of God, when she was approached by Archangel Gabriel and said, hey, you know, I am paraphrasing. <laughs> You're going to have a baby and he's going to be God, you know, and she did question like, well, you know, how's that going to work? Because, you know, I'm I'm without a man, you know, I've never been with a man. But then ultimately she said, let it be whatever God's will is. So she accepted to receive that light within her. She said yes to that and gave birth to Christ in the flesh, fully human, fully divine. We do the same thing. So when we think about light, we do the same thing as we approach into the narthex and open a light, a candle, and we enter into the nave. When we are present in the divine liturgy, heaven on earth, right? Although we may not see it, there's angels and saints, and God himself is seated at the throne, at the altar. And what we do is we pray for the Holy Spirit, the, the, the third person of the Holy Trinity, to descend upon the holy gifts the bread and the wine to make them the body and blood of Christ. And when that's done, we receive the communion in turn, taking it in. And as we exit, we give birth to it. Light is released from us, giving birth to it in works. So light is, in the Orthodox tradition, something very active. Um, it is multifaceted, and it penetrates everything within the context liturgically or even um, within our daily lives. So what I wanted to um, kind of end with, if I may, <laughs> is there, there's a hymn of the um, liturgical um Divine Liturgy by St. John Chrysostom um, that um, is said in every Divine Liturgy after Holy Communion. And it says, we have received the light. And of course, it's a play on words, right? Um, light, we have been given clear view picture of what the kingdom of God is. We have in, taken in the light Christ himself, making it part of us and us a part of him as the body of Christ. And so you'll hear the words and the language that is used reinforcing this spirituality of light and the, its importance. So I will cue that up. And also the images, right? One of the things in the Orthodox tradition is we're very um, visual, like I said, all the senses, but in particularly um, icons, um, vestments, what the priest wears, even the tablecloths, they're very mindful. What color it is tells us what liturgical cycle we're in. Um, it tells us where we're heading. And it really envelops you within the kingdom of God.
I will pass it over to my colleague, Monica Meinhart, who is the chair of Aquinas House, our Catholic House of Studies. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, I learned a lot in just a few minutes. So thank you so much. I took one class in grad school on Orthodox Christianity and where we did go to an Orthodox church and it was very informative, but it's been a while. So um, that was that was nice. Um, so kind of similar theme. It's a good order that we ended up in here. Uh, let me share my screen. So I um, was thinking about which way I wanted to go. There's obviously light throughout the church in just so many areas. I was thinking about the Advent wreath. And I almost talked about that and then I changed my mind. So um, this, I'll start with this quote from St. Jose Maria Escriva as a lead into the words in red here that I'm gonna focus on about light in the Catholic church. He says, we have to learn how to give ourselves to burn before God, like the lamp placed on a lampstand, to give light to those who walk in darkness, like the sanctuary lamps that burn by the altar, giving off light till they are consumed. And so I wanted to kind of draw attention to the sanctuary lamps that are in Catholic churches. Um, when I teach religious education to really young kids, it's one of kind of the first main lessons that I try to teach them about the space in the Catholic church, because I know it's the same everywhere in every Catholic church that wherever you go, you can look for the little red candle. Um, it doesn't have to be red, but in most Catholic churches, um, the, the, the vase around it is often red. Um, and sometimes it's suspended from the ceiling, sometimes it's right next to the tabernacle, but it's always supposed to be close to the tabernacle, the place where um, we as Catholics keep consecrated hosts, um, the body of Christ, until the next Mass. <clears throat> and so um, where does this come from, right? Where do we get this tradition of keeping the light burning um, while there is Jesus present in the tabernacle? And that comes from the book of Exodus. Um, this quote from Father J. Finelli says, in the book of Exodus, the Lord commanded Moses to build the tabernacle of God's presence. It was the meeting place between God and his people. At night, the Lord appeared in the pillar of fire and by day in the pillar of the cloud over the tabernacle. As a sign of his presence, the Lord um, commanded the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light that a lamp may be set up to burn continually. And so in Catholic churches, um, we do, we have a candle lit continually throughout the whole year, night and day, 24 seven, um, next to any tabernacle um, to show us, to remind us as a visible symbol um, that Jesus is present and that um, after mass, no one blows it out. Um, the light burns continually to represent God continually being with us. Um, in the body of Christ. Um, I thought it would be nice to kind of look up, you know, the instruction that we have. So in the Catholic church, we have several um, guidances, you know, things that um, we adhere to as many other churches do as well. And so from the general instruction of the Roman Missal, um, the, the rule there is um, in accordance with traditional custom near the tabernacle, a special lamp fueled by oil or wax should be kept alight to indicate and honor the presence of Christ. So it should be fueled um, often by oil um, or a wax candle. It it would have to be a very extreme circumstance to um, merit like elect, like a, you know, battery powered <laughs> um, light. So to keep um, with this, uh, the, the realness, I guess you could say, right? Um, and then from the code of canon law, it says a special lamp, which indicates and honors the presence of Christ is to shine continuously before a tabernacle in which the most holy Eucharist is reserved. And so when we enter um, the Catholic church, um, we genuflect, we go down on one knee and make the sign of the cross toward the tabernacle. Um, and so that's another way of pointing out, especially to younger children, where where is Jesus? Um, find the red candle and uh, find the tabernacle. And, um, but so what does, um, it's really, I, I had, a, had a whole thing prepared. Now I'm thinking a lot about what Presbyteria said about, um, Mary's fiat, right? When she said, 
yes to the Lord and how that is um, emblematic of our yes as well. And I think you can pair that up really well with where I kind of went, which was St. Therese. Um, so St. Therese has uh, a great reflection on what she calls the divine furnace. And obviously a furnace is, when I typed in furnace for images, you know, I got all these HVAC um, ads that came up. This is the best image of a furnace that I could find. Um, but, uh, you know, we we talk a lot in our faith about um, the divine mercy, and there's usually a symbol there, right, with Jesus with his heart um, on fire. And so St. Therese talks about the divine furnace in her story of a soul. And what that means is that um, we as Christians should go to Christ, the divine furnace who burns away anything that is a part of us that says no, that doesn't say yes, like Mary did. Um, so that when we follow the command to be like Christ, that we let him consume us like a fire, right? Burn away all, not just imperfections, because we're still sinners, we're not going to, you know, um, necessarily burn away all faults, but the goal is to do that um, and eventually get to heaven, but to burn away all of our will. St. Therese always said um, that she always had what she wanted because she only wanted what God gave her. And that is, you know, so um, representative of the surrender. And that was very much her um, mantra. But she also was known for um, childlike surrender. And so I love the way this is, you know, I don't know if this is my favorite quote from Story of a Soul, but it's one of the top. Um, she, she said, Jesus points out to me the only way which leads to love's furnace that way is self-surrender. So it's giving of yourself completely to let Jesus do what he wants, right? For him to decide, for him to be the guide. And she ex equates that with, it's the confidence of a little child who sleeps without fear in its father's arms. And I think we can all relate to that. I mean, just reading that makes me want to cry because it's just the perfect example of that surrender. And as adults, we forget so easily. Um, to do that, to just, you know, like the, well, we were just talking the other day about, I forget who it was with, it was with someone with a newborn baby. And, you know, when they sleep with their arms up like this, <laughs> land on the bed, they're just, you know, a complete surrender. Um, that's what we're kind of drawn to imagine when we look at this candle, um, that we can let Jesus burn away all of our own desires um, and just kind of right in a flame it's all the same you can't see you know if you put something in a flame and it burns away um it's it's not that it's not there necessarily i'm no scientist but um it's that uh you can't see it and so you know that's our call as christians um to reflect that reflect that light um and that that joy you know because not it doesn't always go the way we want it to most of the time it doesn't but like Therese says if we want what Jesus wants then we it sounds kind of crazy like extreme like we throw ourselves into the furnace um <laughs> but if you're just talking about your will right um then it's perfect I think it's just a perfect example so it's such a little humble um candle you know as I was kind of even looking for images I was like all these images are just so kind of blah um, <laughs> when you really think about what it's symbolizing and, um, what's actually going on. But I think that's also the point too. The mystery remains. Um, but we trust anyways, we surrender, even though like Mary, like you said, Prince Vajera, like, we don't know why we can't explain the why, but we throw ourselves in anyways and just accept. So that's what I have for you. And I will, um, turn things over to Rhea. Let me stop my sharing. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to be a little bit naughty, maybe, um, in that I want to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the darkness um, and, and think about the light in relation to darkness, because I think that's what, at least in, in Anglicanism, that's what we do in the season leading up to Christmas. Um, you know, 
it's 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 wonderful, at least for those of us in the northern hemisphere, you know, the way our liturgical season has been designed with Christmas coming, you know, just after the winter solstice, where the light is coming into the world, you know, literally the days are getting longer, there is more light. Um, but it also means that the weeks coming up to that, the weeks preceding that are the darkest weeks of the year, the days are shortest. And my husband and I moved uh, from Oklahoma, where we had lived for 25 years, back home to Nova Scotia in 2019, and just that diff that 10 degrees latitude difference. I mean, the the days are very short, the nights are very long. It's dark by 4:30. Four, four, you know, sun goes down by soon after four. Um, by the time we get to December 20th or so, and um, yeah, so. This is all, I think, symbolic of what is happening to us or should be happening to us spiritually. When when my husband and I came back here, um, that first fall we were back here, we were uh, invited to join a, a reading group at, in the, at a church in the city that was being taught by a former professor of ours who was also, of course, long retired. In fact, I think he gave the first university lecture I ever heard. Um, and it it ended um about this time of year it was just before advent and so we, we actually met in a church like in the church itself in the in the chancel we were sitting in the choir pews sort of facing each other and he sat on a chair in the in the aisle in the mil middle in front, of, in front of the altar and we had finished and we were gathering up our things and obviously somehow talk had gone to advent but this is what i remember is him sort of struggling to stand up and standing there leaning on his cane with two hands and he says you know there is no feast without a fast i that was the last time i saw him as things turned out a few months it was covid lockdown we didn't meet again and uh within another year or so his health began to decline and he has since died but for some reason that memory just stuck with me you know his voice saying there is no feast without a fast. Now, Anglicans have never fasted like the Orthodox, but <laughs> there is a real spiritual fast um, in the Anglican tradition for Advent. Advent kind of, you know, while we're getting ready, while we're, you know, doing our Christmas baking and putting up Christmas decorations and, you know, wrapping gifts and sending Christmas cards, we should be preparing spiritually for what we're about to celebrate. So there's this outward physical preparation, but also this inward spiritual preparation. And when Archbishop Thomas Cranmer in the 16th century was, was producing the English prayer book, the English Book of Common Prayer, he was dissatisfied with the Advent, uh, the collect for the first Sunday in Advent. Um, typically what he did is he took the, the Latin prayers, translated them into English, sometimes, you know, adjusted them a little bit, but um, he wrote a whole new collect for the first Sunday of Advent. And so I want to, to read that and just take a look at it. It is a fine example of uh, the sort of the masterful, uh, English prose of the 16th and 17th century. So this is the prayer which would be prayed on the first Sunday in Advent. And as the rubric at the bottom says, it is to be repeated every day with the other colleagues in Advent until Christmas Eve. So we pray this prayer every morning, every evening, every Eucharist, um, all through Advent. So I'm just going to read it. Almighty God, Give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which thy son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost now and ever. Amen. So you, you see these wonderful contrasts, you know, at the beginning we have, we have the darkness, the works of darkness and the armor of light. 
the the epistle reading for this Sunday is Romans 13, where this comes from. Um, we have the contrast between this mortal life and the life immortal. We have the contrast between the first coming of Jesus and great humility, which is a wonderful phrase in and of itself, great humility. Um, and when his the second coming, when he comes in his glorious majesty. So Advent in in uh, certainly in the Anglican tradition, uh, probably in the in the Roman Catholic tradition as well, focuses on the end, you know, on heaven. We are to turn our minds to what are called the four last things. So preachers typically, I can't say they all do anymore, but typically did, uh, preach on death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And so as we are getting ready to celebrate the coming of the light, which is the life of man being made flesh, um, coming to dwell among us, we are also, th we're actually thinking about death. As we, as we prepare to celebrate his birth, we're thinking about um, death and the life that comes after that death. Are we prepared? Are we preparing for that? Are we um, casting away the works of darkness? Are we clad in the armor of light in, the, in Jesus Christ? Have we prepared in our hearts a home for him? Are our lamps lit? Are we waiting? Are we watching for him to come? Um, are we ready to die? You know, this is, an, is another way of, of simply putting it. Are we ready to die? So as we prepare to celebrate the birth of a baby, um, which is also one of those extraordinary paradoxes, I think, Christian paradoxes, um, the almighty God, the word through whom all things are made, comes into being as a helpless, speechless infant um as we prepare for that uh to celebrate that you know we need to spend some time sort of you might say contemplating the darkness thinking about the darkness that that light dispels thinking about sin about death um and the the promises that that light brings to us and i think if we do that if only we would um Spend some time looking at the darkness in our own souls, some time in self-examination, in repentance. Um, then we're really ready to rejoice in the light when Christmas comes. And Christmas, you know, Advent uh, starts the fourth Sunday before Christmas. So it can be four weeks. This, this year it's just over three weeks because Christmas is on a Monday. But Christmas itself <laughs> starts on the 25th or midnight on the 24th and it goes for 12 days it's a 12-day feast um and also in our tradition there are three other major feast days within those 12 days and then there's the epiphany uh, so we have 13 days to celebrate that light uh and, and there's even i will add the often forgotten 40th day feast um 40 days after jesus was born the Blessed Virgin went to the temple to be purified according to the Jewish custom where Jesus, you know, the baby Jesus is taken up by Simeon who says, calls him the light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of a people Israel, a God's people Israel. Um, so I'm just saying, I leave my crush out until February 2nd. And I think it's okay to leave your Christmas lights up until February 2nd. Um, but here's here's what immediately hit my, my mind when I heard this teacher friend say there is no feast without a fast. He meant, of course, you fast first and then you feast. And so spiritually, if we know we're sinners and in need of a savior, then we can really rejoice in that saving grace but that's not what the secular world does does it people start feasting on thanksgiving and they feast for a month and then by the time 
December 25th comes around, most people are pretty weary. Um, and I've seen Christmas trees out on the side of the road by December 26th, 27th. You know, Christmas is over. The decorations come down. They're finished feasting. And by January, well, maybe we'll give it to the second, maybe January 1st, everybody's on a diet, right? Getting ready to hit the gym. So, you know, they celebrate something. I don't know what. Celebrate for a month. And then, then they fast. And why did they fast? Because they feel guilty. They've been overeating, drinking too much, spending too much money. And so now they go into uh, sort of, you will, if you will, a kind of material repentance and uh, feel guilty about what they've done. That's not, you know, that's not how we should do it. <laughs> Let's fast first and then we can feast um, in joy and not feel guilty about our feasting. But we don't appreciate the light until we spent some time in the darkness. That's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, ladies, thank you so much for what each one of you shared. And it's incredible because I didn't hear any single one of your discussion prior to this moment. And yet somehow the weaving of the message was so beautiful and so clearly done. It's like um, the contrast that Rhea ended us with was really woven throughout, like with Presbytera starting that the light doesn't shine out from us until there's an intake, that, that we go, we take it in in order to shine it out. And um, and then this idea from Monica about the burning up in the furnace, the full surrender in order to be fully fulfilled, that I'm most content and most satisfied in God because he gives me, I, I'm satisfied because I want what he gives already. Um, so profound. And then the the observation that is so um, beautifully summed up that the feasting comes after the fasting. The light is appreciated because, precisely because it contrasts with the darkness that we've seen and known and experienced. So I can't thank you enough for your beautiful, profound observations. And now is the time to just open it up to any dialogue. And I'm going to tag Allison for anything you want anybody to comment further on, talk about, or, you know, illuminations that you personally had, whatever you want to share, Allison, it's all yours. Well, I could probably listen to y'all talk all day, <laughs> but I know you have things to do. You, if you know me and I know most of you do, I'm a planner and a note taker. <laughs> So I have, a, I don't know if the notes are in order, but um, yeah, thank you so much. I was so inspired and I love how it, it all weaves together, but yet it's also a little different, right? It's, which is, which is so nice. Um, so I think some of these notes are reflected in each, but I, I wrote down how light you all said is so symbolic. And then you mentioned the spirituality of light. Um, and Presbyter, I think I wrote some notes after you, we receive light from the unwavering light. Um, and then I sometimes, um, I love how we're reflecting on light this year. And I always think of light also as truth, right? Um, truth from God. So we receive light, truth from God. And then I think this was you, Presbyter, we are little lights of Christ, right? That is sort of, when I started listening, um, I thought, well, what, what do I want to say about light? So then um, I always bring it back to what I see in my children and my students. And then Presbyterian, when you said we are little lights of Christ, I thought, aha, <laughs> that's my, <laughs> but um, I always um, think about, um, you know, that expression when you see light in there in someone's eyes, right? And you, it, it's true. So I bring that, um, and I find myself sometimes, um, often in grammar, right? I'll see that, and I'll say it aloud. I say, oh, I saw that light bulb. <laughs> I, you know, when you see the light bulb go off, and I, oh, I mention, I say, I just saw some light bulbs go off. But, you know, there's a deeper meaning there. Um, and so um, 
And then also Christ will radiate within us, right? Um, so, and I always, um, and then I think um, you all also said reflect the reflection of light and joy um, is so important as we reflect back. Um, but just the idea of light um, as truth as well. Um, I was thinking about that. Um, so thank you. I have a whole paper full of wonderful, beautiful notes, but those were my reflections as you each spoke. Um, so yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, definitely I find such joy, you know, the laughter of children, the light you see, there is light in the eyes. We can all see it in each other. Um, so yeah, that's what I found myself thinking about as well. Beautiful reflection. Panelists, do you want to speak uh, in response to one another or anything else that came to mind? I like what you said, Alison, at the very end, which was um, the reflection of light. And I had to pause and think, okay, science. Um, you know, when we open up, <laughs> when we open up a light and the room is dark, there's not a reflection, but it's only reflection when there's something that has an, uh, the ability to take an image and copy it, right? So I'm like, oh, yeah, right? So we are a ref not only a reflection of Christ and little Christ, right? So I really liked how you said that because I had to stop and think for a minute on on that point like yeah we have to be open we have to prepare the the caves of our hearts right to receive and then it be reflected out and i really like that imagery that you use at the very end yeah i um what you mentioned radiate, which goes along with the furnace, right? And we have radiators kind of in our house right now, right? Um, and so to map onto that idea if, of, of like the body of Christ um, as, the, as the church, as all Christians, um, how do we, how does our surrender um, to God unite with that fire that divine furnace to keep the fuel burning to then radiate the whole house um, radiate heat throughout the whole house and that heat um no then, then the whole house would be potentially either the whole church like the whole body of christ um, community and it can radiate to the whole world around us those who are not in the church as well those who are not christian Right. I mean, we, I talk about that a lot in some of my classes, you know, you just haven't, you ever had an experience where you just see someone and they radiate joy and it just makes you want some of it. And you don't know what it is. You might not even have a conversation with them, but it's just that little bit. That's like, oh, I want what they have. And then it might set the path for years down the road to eventually find Christ. Um, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to find radiator pictures now, <laughs> take some, take some pictures of my radiator <laughs> from my next dog. <laughs> Dante just does something with a, an image of the reflection, the bouncing reflection of light, um, which is what I was thinking about when when Presbyterian Maria was, was speaking, that where where he refers to the souls as mir mirrors. So so each or, or, and sun. So so each each soul reflects the light of the sun or the S O N sun. Um but so they become these little Christs as as Presbyterian said, reflecting this this light, but then they reflect off one another. You know, so if, if you sort of picture that image, you just get this ever increasing light, right? It's just so beautiful. And I like I like that image. Um, you know, it's almost like geometric in nature, right? That all these lines are going in certain, but in the 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 beauty of what is not only the light, but the, the artistry of the weaving of that tapestry. Oh my goodness. I can just, you know, imagine how it looks. 
And I like what you said, Monica, the sense of relinquishing. So um, another thing that you had mentioned, and, and Allison mentioned it too, and so did Rhea, which is, you know, you said, you know, this position, right? The Oran's position of total relinquishing. And um, that's what Mary did, right? You know, saying, my will is your will, your will is my will, right? Um, and, and accepting that wholeheartedly. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard to give birth to Christ. And I use the, you know, birth with a small B, right. Um, to reflect that light in the world because other things get in the way. Right. And kind of isolate that light almost like a like a beam instead of a lighthouse right and so i i find that interesting because um you know is it is it an idol of like what you said Rhea? we celebrate christmas now we're done treat out everything done got presents that's all it was okay moving on um but is it truly what we're supposed to celebrate that God became man so that man can become like God. And that's, um, San Athanasios. So the, the position of relinquishing as it may sound easy is really difficult. And of course that's the first step. So, you know, that reminded me of that. And of course, the three use in the holy fire, right? The three use. Holy, 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 holy is, Christ, you know, God. And they were never burned. They were never consumed. They were part of that unwavering light. So beautiful, ladies. Thank you. I'm going to be reflecting on this all day, week, and month now. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's inspiring, though. I'm so glad you hold these coffee talks. And even when I can't join, I always listen. But it's so nice to actually be able to, um, you know, uh, bounce these things off of each other and share. So thank you. Well, I, I concur. It's been uh, so sweet and rich. And I will be th this moment has um, really, I feel like teed me up for the uh, Advent season and then the celebration. And I love what you said, Rhea, about like, I'm not, it was an offhanded comment, but you know, in the secular world, I'm not sure what they're celebrating. Um, it, that's not throwing shade uh, metaphorically or literally on them, but it's, it's that, um, we, um, have truly the light of the world to celebrate and to anticipate that coming is also such an important time to um, really kind of almost d dwell in the darkness to understand how desperately he was needed in order to tee us up and to ready us for the full celebration of what his coming really meant to us, that it was um, the hope of all the world you know, <laughs> bring you good tidings of great joy that'll be to all people. Um, so I feel very blessed to um, sit under your, your reflections, your wisdom, your guidance. Thank you all for joining us. And I can't wait to share this conversation with um, the wider Scole community and Scole world so that it can uh, continue to be a blessing and that light will continue to shine and be reflected among us. Thank you again so much. God can bless. I add? Can I yes. add one thing? <laughs> Just to, I know we could go on for hours, so I you can cut me off after this. But what you're saying about that feasting before fasting, I heard it said once from a pastor who said the um, in and of itself, the fact that all the Christ Christmas decorations are out and people are putting up their lights already, and it seems to happen earlier and earlier each year that the lights go up. 
he saw it as an indication of that hunger for Christ that you don't realize that, you know, you have no idea what you're even celebrating, but yet that innate, you know, God-shaped hole that we're all designed for Christ and for God, um, that it's in every one of us. And so that's an outward manifestation. So my proposal, which I just thought of, is we often, I know, I mean, I think a lot of churches um, invite people to come to mass or to church or to service for Christmas and then again on Easter. But what if we started inviting people during Advent, you know, say, hey, come to the first Sunday of Advent, come to the first Sunday of Lent, then they can see the full picture. Um, I don't know if it would work, but hey, can't hurt to try. <laughs> That's, That's it. That's exactly all that. <laughs> And I'm really glad you said it, Monica, because I mean, I'm going to be honest, I was about to put up my Christmas tree. So I feel I feel a sense of authorization in that this can be my anticipation, um, my hunger and my longing for the light of the world. Uh, that's such a great reminder, too. And I'm and I. I pray that all of us would be particularly mindful at this time, whether it's in our classrooms with the students we work with and live with the families that we touch and and then just our day-to-day -day livings and dwellings that um, we would be those little Christ, the little lights that are really reflecting him and drawing others to him. May it be so in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye-bye. So much.